So for anyone who discovered this channel at any point in the past year, which I am 85% sure is thanks to this fucking mad lad, you might remember that I made a couple of projects. The first being the Studio Ghibli project where I talked about every film the studio made, also known as the Director's Project before the Director's Project was even a thing, and then I switched it to just a single director, in this case the films of Makoto Shinkai, which was a way bigger success than I ever thought it was. Ever since I finished it, I wanted to stray away from it for a bit, just the overall decision of making a project. So I, I just started talking about movies I wanted to talk about, just because, out of personal preference, while at the same time, I was thinking about who I wanted to spotlight next, eventually. And after further discussion by my research team that totally isn't one person, the next director chosen was the anime industry's family man, Mabadu Hosoda. Now, just like with Shinkai and Ghibli, I didn't grow up with Hosoda, although I am in the same age range, maybe younger uh, than someone who would be, and my only exposure to him was about a year and a half ago when I decided to binge watch all of his films. I remember not being blown away by any of them, but also not thinking any of them were terrible, so it will be interesting looking through all of them again to see if any of them catch my attention even more than the first time. And given his latest film, Bell, is currently in post-production and slated to be released in Japan this summer and hopefully in North America in early 2022, this feels like a great time to go over everything in build-up to this latest release. But, unlike those previous projects, I'm not actually going to cover every film Hosoda has directed, just the ones that aren't related to any long-running anime franchise, because god knows I want to be in those discussions. So I might as well start with the film that brought him into the spotlight and made him more than just an anime director. This is the Mamoru Hosoda Project, Episode 1, The Girl Who Left Through Time. The film follows Makoto, who is seen in the opening moments of the film hanging out and playing baseball with her two friends, Chiaki and Kosuke. That is, until she gains the ability to quote-unquote leap through time after falling on a walnut-shaped object in the science lab. Her powers later established in an incident where it was sure she was going to get hit by a train, but she ends up being fine. At first, she uses these powers for herself by preventing the same situations from happening like they were established earlier, and just goofing off. One of my personal highlights being when she goes back in time to replay the same karaoke session with Chiaki and Kosuke, because she's that energetic. But when she realizes her constant leaping resulted in a tragic consequence, and she only has a limited number of leaps left, she relies on what she can do in order to shape a better future for her and her friends. There are two sections of this part that will be covered. The first being Hosoda's career in the industry before he got to Madhouse and the intellectual property itself of The Girl Who Left Through Time. Mamoru Hosoda began his career as an animator for Toei Animation in 1991 before he would get his first directing title on a pair of Digimon Adventure shorts in 1999, which were later combined as part of Digimon the movie the next year. The film got the attention of Studio Ghibli producer Toshio Suzuki, who famously hired him in September 2001 to direct the studio's latest film, an adaptation of the Diana Wynne Jones novel Howl's Moving Castle. But unfortunately, his dreams of working at the studio would come to an end in the summer of 2002, when Hosoda left the project due to creative differences and went back to Toei. He would work on a number of shorts and TV episodes for the studio, the most significant being in episode 40 of the final season of the Magical Girl series Ojimajo Doremi, released on November 10th, 2002, an episode inspired by his time at Studio Ghibli. The episode covers the titular character Doremi meeting and eventually hanging out with a retired witch named Mirai who consoles her about her future. Ironically, that episode got the attention of Masao Murayama, the COO of Madhouse. He contacted Hosoda and proposed he worked on an upcoming project, to which he was hesitant on. After deciding to make an adaptation of the Yasutaka Sutsui novel The Girl Who Left Through Time in February 2004, Hosoda agreed to resign from Toei in order to work on the project, but not before they got him working on one more film for Toei which ended up turning into the 2005 film One Piece, Baron Omatsuri and the Secret Island, a movie I have heard nobody mentioned he worked on for some reason, so I'm, I'm just doing it here. Like, no joke, I've watched a bunch of videos on this stuff, quick tangent, nobody mentioned the fact he worked on this One Piece movie, it's weird. Now for the girl who left through time itself, one of the most iconic stories in Japanese literature, 
which was released by Yasutaka Sutsui back in 1967, about a high school girl who gains the ability to time travel and ends up living the same day a la Groundhog Day, except it's not that depressing. The first official adaptation of the book was not a movie, but a two-part series which aired on NHK in 1972, but not much is really known about it. The first film adaptation would be released in 1983 with the film The Little Girl Who Conquered Time, which was directed by the late Nobuhiko Obayashi, known as the director of the 1977 film Haosu, aka the weirdest movie I've ever seen in my life. No, but seriously, nothing I will say will do that film justice. Just go watch it. After this video, of course. It was adapted again in 1994 as a five-episode miniseries with music composed by Joe Hisaishi from Studio Ghibli fame, and again with another film in 1997 before the 2006 anime film. The success of Hosoda's film spawned another adaptation in 2010 with the film Time Traveler, The Girl Who Left Through Time, which plays as a sequel to the 1983 film and Makoto's voice actress, Ri Sanaka, plays the lead role here as well. Unlike the other films I just mentioned, I actually watched this film and have some thoughts about it. The movie follows Akari as, per her mother's request, she tries to go back in time to 1972, but instead accidentally goes back to 1974 and befriends an aspiring film director. While the story is completely different from the 2006 film, and given that is the reason this one exists in the first place, both of them do have some of the same issues. I'll get more into what the 2006 one has, but frankly, it all comes down to something in the second half, which more or less threw everything off logically, but it never diminished the film's atmosphere, and I'm willing to give it a pass for now given it's a sequel and I never saw the 1983 film. The acting wasn't great, although I can't say it was terrible either, but the special effects really remind you this came out in 2010. When Akane was traveling through time, I swear to god it looked like something out of a Linkin Park music video. But overall, it's a pretty calm and, in some cases, wholesome film with enough to capture your attention and keep you interested. I know I don't do ratings anymore, but fuck it. To finish it off, I'm giving this a 5 out of 10. This film's on Amazon Prime right now, if anyone wants to watch it, you go ahead, I do suggest it, it just wasn't my cup of tea for the most part. Going back to the original movie itself, after it was decided to make the film a sequel to the original novel, production on the film began in September of 2004, and screenwriter Satoko Okudera finished the first draft a couple of months later before it had to be completely overturned due to being too similar to the original novel, and another first draft was completed in January 2005, which shows the main premise of the final product, the plot difference being made in order to be more realistic to both newer audiences and anyone unfamiliar with the book, the same reason the film's main character Makoto is silly and energetic per Hosoda's request compared to the mature protagonist of the book, which is later shown through the many decisions she makes after gaining her powers that were unanimously agreed by critics and basically everybody to be something that anybody her age or otherwise would do. This was only a couple of pieces of a bigger puzzle which later spelled the success of The Girl Who Left Through Time. When making this film, Hosoda Okudera and the film's producers, Takashi Watanabe and Yuichiro Saito, made it to where The Girl Who Left Through Time isn't an animated film, but instead a feature film which happens to be animated, a somewhat ambitious decision in the anime industry in the mid-2000s thanks to the countrywide stigma around anime films that any film from Studio Ghibli was good and can compete with the live-action film market, and any film not from Ghibli was just labeled an anime film and wouldn't go further than that, taking it out of a genre that would have put it in a very dismissive bubble, which, just like the decision to make it a sequel, is part of the plan to make the film its own expression. This is shown by the choices made during production, such as the cast being made up of movie stars instead of anime voice actors, the decision to go without shading on the character, something that's seen in previous Hosoda projects, and a request by Hosoda to character designer Yoshiyuki Satomoto, known mainly for his work on Neon Genesis Evangelion, to make the exact opposite of what he did there and make the characters look as simple and unconventional as possible in an anime sense, in order to be more expressive to the audience, to the point where they looked and act like real people and aren't, quote, cosplay worthy, which is already a battle they lost before they even started at this point. Production went on until March of 2006, and it was released the following July in Japan and the following November in North America, and in February of 2007, the film won the first ever Best Animated Feature Prize at the Japanese Oscars, an award Hosoda would surely get used to winning over the course of his career. 
And in the years since its release, although there has been no clear connection, the film has since started a trend of anime series and films with elements of time travel that have garnered critical praise, such as The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, which came out around the same year, Steins Gate, Madoka Magica, and Your Name, among many, many other shows and films in the industry. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory! Okay, apparently I have to break this down into two sections too. Because while I do have my personal thoughts on the film itself, I also have some thoughts on a couple of prominent fan theories that have been posted on YouTube and Reddit since the film's release. But to do that, I have to spoil the second half of the movie. So here's the timestamp for anyone who wants to skip this part and not want to be spoiled. There's your warning, 3, 2, 1. So while Makoto is trying to make things right without any time leaps left, it's revealed that Chiaki is from the future and the walnut-shaped object he fell on at the beginning of the movie was his, and the reason why he's here was because he wants to see a painting that, by his time, would have been destroyed. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to see it, and he's unable to go back to his own time to he prevented Kosuke and his new girlfriend from getting hit by the train using Makoto's faulty bike. But even though he can't go back to his time, nevertheless, he fucks off and leaves Makoto anyway. She, over time, develops a crush on him and finds out his final time leap restored her final time leap, allowing her to use it to go back to before she got her powers so Chiaki can get his final time leap back so he can go back in time. Follow me on this? When they meet up in the aftermath, Makoto tells him she'll preserve the painting with her aunt at the museum long enough as much as she can so it could be seen in his time. The first theory states that the girl who left through time isn't about time travel and knowing what to do about your future, no. It's about a futuristic con artist who uses his abilities to use people, mainly those who are unsure of their future, in order to preserve the painting. What? First off, that sounds dumb. Second off, that would be pretty interesting if we knew the whole story. By that, I mean there was a time where it was established why he was in her time in the first place. All I needed was to see it. I was going to remember it for the rest of my life. But after that, nothing was explained as to why the painting was so significant to him. Why that painting in particular, I don't know. While looking more into it, I saw a few people type out that his inability to remember why he wanted to see it further pushes the film's themes of disconnection. N yeah, no, I'm not buying that. It, it just comes off as an excuse by fans of the film to dismiss its poor writing. Stop it. Don't do it. You're embarrassing yourself. Stop it. Get some help. Plus, it practically dismisses everything that happened in the first half of the movie, and I just can't. I, I just can't. That first half, oh boy, that's, that's some really good shit right there. The other theory was what Chiaki said at the end of that conversation. Now, let me set the stage. Makoto is pacing a little bit. She's crying, got the close-up and the wide shot. They're still in that same spot. It's a beautiful, emotional moment. Uh, she's crying over the fact Chiaki left. But after a little bit, Chiaki comes back and says, I'll be waiting for you. Compared to the last one, this one was pretty simple to make an opinion on from the get-go. And it's in my opinion, that he's implying when Makoto gets older and has solidified her future, she'll stumble upon Chiaki in the same state he was when they were in high school. Honestly, I actually don't know why people were considering this anywhere near debatable. This just comes off as extremely tame. Now, for my actual thoughts on the film itself. The script, in my opinion, was the best and worst part of the movie. For the first two acts, in combination with the light color palette, the film's lighthearted tone, the amazing art styles while Makoto is traveling through time, easily the best part visually in the entire film, the perfect editing, and the stellar sound design, the film felt like a slice-of-life drama romance anime film with a sci-fi plot element which gave it a unique feel for its time. But everything fell apart when the third act rolled around, and more unnecessary sci-fi elements were added to the story that were just left unexplained. It, it just comes off like a mess. And what made it worse was there was a solid buildup between Makoto and Chiaki in terms of a possible relationship, but that third act could have had a, a rewrite, maybe two, in my opinion. But again, apart from that final half hour, it's pretty freaking great. The characters were pretty well written. 
Uh, while doing research for this video, I tend to find that Makoto comes off as one of those characters where you hear one person praise her and another person hate her for the exact same reason. The reason being she's very energetic, but can also come off as annoying. And personally, with time, no pun intended, I had no issue with her. The only character I couldn't really put my finger on, though, was her aunt, Kazuko, the protagonist of the original novel. But even though she is the protagonist there, I still think it would have been helpful to anyone who has never heard of the original story before to explain more how she knows about the time leaps, because she's the first one that tells Makoto that these are time leaps when they're talking in her office in the museum. And she hints at it a little bit, but they don't go farther. I know she used to time leap, and it, it kind of implies it. But the issue was, I didn't get that from this film directly. It might be a nod to anyone who read the book, but who else would know? That's the issue. The film's ability to push its message without stopping the plot was pretty sweet. It uses the show-don't-tell rule to express that recurring message that time is fleeting by the minutes and we should live life to the fullest. The biggest example being the multiple times throughout the film, the phrase time waits for no one is shown throughout the film, primarily on the blackboard of the science lab, and it's the name of the song they're singing in the karaoke scene. Personally, both the sub and the dub are exceptional. Emily Hurst, who voices Makoto, is a major highlight on the dub side. It's such a shame that she doesn't really do stuff like that anymore. The music was pretty divisive for me as well. The soundtrack for the film was pretty bland, but the film used Box Goldberg variations, public domain music, in an inventive way to indicate not only where Makoto was in time, but also indicates all the subtle differences in how she struggles to manage it. I'm linking a video down below which explains the Goldberg variations in this film a lot better than I ever will if you guys are interested. And the direction choices really make it stand out, as it's seen primarily in the use of the tracking shot, like when Makoto runs for like a minute straight, that's the scene everyone remembers, and how he uses the same wide shots again and again, which was something Hosoda did funny enough in that one Ojimaja Doremi episode he directed, even in the same place too. A decision that was done previously out of lack of time and budget, but instead is used for a thematic purpose in the film. Overall, The Girl Who Left Through Time isn't a bad movie. Take away most of the stuff in the second half and you got yourself a masterpiece. Fortunately, in the context of all the big figures who worked on the film, there is more to talk about and in the coming years, and honestly, Hosoda's filmography just gets better from here, so I'm not relatively mad about what I saw. It's just more likely I wouldn't see it again compared to Summer Wars or Wolf Children. Is it as good as when I initially saw it? No, not really. But it's also nowhere near terrible. And I have no problem talking about and suggesting anybody check out the anime equivalent to Life is Strange.